Hey guys, welcome back to Bob Up Chem, and this episode is part of Unit 8 and 18 Acids and Bases, and we're looking at properties of acids and bases. Comment below, let me know what you're thinking. Subscribe, like, hit the bell icon, and share the video. Check out our other channels, Pop em Up Food and Pop em Up Life. Links and timestamps all in the description. So today we're going to be looking at the different types of reactions of acids and bases and looking at how dilutions work as well. Here's a little refresh to get you started. Which statement explains why ammonia can act as a Lewis base? Pause the video here to give yourself some time for that. Okay, great. Well, simplest thing to do to this would obviously be to draw the Lewis structure of ammonia. If we do that, we see that it's got a lone pair, which in itself already cancels out B, C, and D, leaving A. So first reaction we're gonna have a look at then is neutralization. So that is acid plus base goes to salt and water. These reactions are always exothermic. Um, and it's good to remember that although this is called neutralization, it doesn't necessarily give a perfectly neutral solution. It just means that we're producing water. Your bases here can be anything from metal hydroxides, metal oxides, and ammonia. Next reaction we're going to look at is the acids and metals. So this is always producing a salt and hydrogen this time. Again, always exothermic. And depending on the metal, these can have varying reactivities. Things like lithium much more reactive. So lithium plus hydrochloric acid is going to give us lithium chloride and water. Okay, the last one we're going to look at then is acids and carbonates here producing salt carbon dioxide and water again not producing a neutral solution and we can include both the carbonates and the hydrogen carbonates here and we're going to look at naming salt just after this if you're not comfortable with that so carbonates are co3 2 minus uh, so we can have the example here of uh, sodium carbonate is going to be Na2CO3 and a hydrogen carbonate is HCO3 minus. So that sodium hydrogen carbonate would be NaHCO3. Before we look at naming salts, I wanted to give one little note on indicators. We're going to look at this in more detail later in the unit, but indicators are not used to determine the pH. They are merely used to determine if there has been a change in pH i.e. an indication of that change. So just bear that in mind. You've got examples of these in your data booklet. So let's have a look at naming some salts. Two simple rules here. The first part of the name of the salt comes from the first word of the base. So for example, if the base you use is magnesium hydroxide, then you're gonna use magnesium as the first word of your salt. If you have lithium hydroxide, then of course, you're going to have lithium as the first word of your salt. Still, you can use other things from hydroxides and we could have something like sodium carbonate. Sodium carbonate, you would then take the sodium as the first word of your salt. All of these come together with the second word of your salt being taken from the name of the acids. So here are some examples like sulfuric acid giving sulfates, citric acid giving citrates, etc. To make this a bit clearer, let's have a look at some examples. So for this first one, I had ammonium hydroxide. So that was my base. So I'm going to have ammonium as my first word and sulfuric acid gives sulfates. So it would of course produce ammonium sulfate. The second reaction, I have magnesium oxide. So magnesium oxide is my base, so it's going to be magnesium. Hydrochloric acid forms chlorides. So the salt produced with this reaction is going to be magnesium chloride. Lastly, I have calcium carbonate and nitric acid. So calcium carbonate being my base means I have calcium as my first word and nitric acid forms nitrates. So the salt produced in this reaction is going to be calcium nitrate. So give yourself some practice and try these ones here. Pause the video, give yourself some time for that. 
Going through those then, sodium carbonate and sulfuric acid is going to give us sodium sulfate, lithium oxide plus citric acid is going to give us lithium citrate, iron hydroxide plus nitric acid is going to give us iron nitrate. So the last school we want to have a look at is ion equations. Now these are going to come in important in unit 9 as well. But really they're just to illustrate what's actually occurring in the reaction. So if we have that little aqueous sign, then we know we have an ionic compound that's broken down. So HCl we could write as H plus and Cl minus. Same with NaOH being Na plus and OH minus with NaCl being Na plus and Cl minus. H2O of course is a liquid, it's in its covalent form so it would not break down into ions. Now what's interesting about this is we can cancel the things on both sides because of course they're just spectators. They're not doing anything if they exist on both sides of the equation. So if we cancel all of those out, lo and behold, we find that overall reaction for neutralization. H plus OH minus gives us H2O, which may have been what we expected, but it illustrates perfectly that these are neutralization reactions. So let's do a couple of questions on your whiteboards then. First question, what is the name of this compound? Pause it here to give yourself some time. Pop them up. It is of course lithium bromide. Next, what is the name of this compound? Pause it here to give yourself some time. Pop them up. It is of course calcium phosphate. Last question then. What is the formula of potassium hydrogen carbonate? Pause it here to give yourself the time. Pop them up. It is of course KHCO3. Remember HCO3 minus being the formula for the hydrogen carbonate ion. So now we want to have a look at the pH scale and dilutions. So you may already be familiar with the pH scale. It goes from 0 to 14. And 0 indicates very acidic, 14 very alkali. They can actually go outside this range, as we'll see when we do more calculations with this. But for now, we want to look at what these numbers mean. So pH stands for potential hydrogen. And pH is determined by the concentration of H plus in solution, which is given by this equation the negative log base 10 of the H plus concentration. Conversely, we can use the pH to determine H plus concentration by using 10 to the minus pH. So for each one step on a logarithmic scale, and therefore in the pH, we see a tenfold decrease in the concentration of H plus from pH 0 to pH 1. If we look at pH 2, we're going to get 1 times 10 to the minus 2, i.e. 0.01 moles per decimeter. So as we increase the pH, hopefully you may already notice, that we're going to continue that trend. So for pH 3, we would have 0.001 moles per decimeter, and so on and so forth. However, this brings a little conundrum that does that just mean that bases are simply really, really, really weak solutions of H plus concentration? Mm, well, it's not quite that simple. In fact, we can't actually go above pH 7 just by removing H plus concentration because, for example, 1 times 10 to the minus 8 H plus is technically a base. However, we can't just keep serially diluting an acid to get to this concentration and then get the pH above 7. The reason for this is to do with the equilibria that water establishes, which obviously lies heavily to the left hand side. But at STP, we have that value for the concentration of H plus being pH 7, which means that the concentration is 1 times 10 to the minus 7. And the overall total of the two concentrations of OH minus and H plus are equal and we'll look at this in more depth when we do the ionic product of water which i'll be releasing next week but suffice to say the only way we can make a solution basic is by adding these oh minus ions okay so we mentioned dilutions and 
Serial dilutions are just basically a dilution that you do by the same factor and you do this in multiple steps. And so for this, we multiply the dilution factor for each step. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to incrementally dilute a solution and allow us to reduce our random error as we get the uh, solution to a lower concentration. And to work out the dilution factor, we have a very simple equation, which is dilution factor equals initial volume divided by the total new volume. So let's have a look at an example here. I take one mil of my sample, so that's my initial. So I'm gonna do one divided by the new total. So that's gonna be one plus nine. So I'm gonna have one divided by 10 which equals a dilution factor of 1 to 10. Let's walk through another example. Here, I want to work out my dilution factor, and I have 0.2 mils, so I'm going to do 0.2 divided by the new total, which is 0.2 plus 3.8, which is going to be 0.2 over 4, which is going to be 1 to 20. So it's a 1 to 20 dilution factor. Okay, let's get you trying that then. Here's your first question. Work out the dilution factor here. Pause the video now. Give yourself some time for this. Pop them up. Okay, brilliant. Here, well, your initial is 0 0.5. So we're going to do 0 0.5 over 0 0.5 plus. 4.5 which is 0 0.5 over 5 which equals 1 over 10 so we've got a 1 to 10 dilution factor to summarize then make sure you do some questions and that you're able to find the concentration using ph values and dilution factors thanks for watching guys comment below like subscribe hit the bell icon share this video this channel and our other channels as always practice makes slightly better.